Hello and welcome to the AV Forums podcast for Bank Holiday Monday, the 29th of May. And joining me on this sunny edition, our assistant editor, Steve Withers. I've been expecting you, Mr Bond. News editor, Mark Hodgkinson. What can I offer you? Sheep size? Dates? Fuck a martini? And audio reviewer, Ed Selly. You ever get the feeling that somebody doesn't like you? All the time, Ed. The Mustang is the world's most popular sports car. Problem with this, I have with this, uh, this obviously came from Ford press release because they're now selling it worldwide and uh, obviously that boosts their their sales figures. I mean, it sells by the bucket load in the States. I think it's one every 20 seconds is sold in the States, only beaten by Ford's other vehicle, which is the F-150 pickup where they sell one every five seconds which is astonishing um but yeah the mustang has gone worldwide problem i've got with this is it's not a sports car i don't care what anybody says it's not a sports car it is a gt car it's a grand tourer it's a muscle car it's it's noisy it it, it can it can be fast but it's not particularly fast it can now handle the corners but not particularly well <laughs> but it does but it does get You're really selling this one phil <laughs> well you buy you buy the Mustang because it's it's a a character. It's a characterful car. Uh, it draws attention to itself. It's it's a motor and icon. It's been in production solid for fifty years. Um, well, fifty plus years. And it'll be fifty three years. It's been in production now. And yes, it's gone worldwide. So it's it's now the world's best selling. Well, this is sports car, but I, I disagree with it. Sports car is a Porsche or. Uh, or, or, or of similar vein, you know, a two-seater lightweight. You can take the roof off now and again. That type. That's a sports car to me. I mean, I, that, I think the Mustang. It's a cruiser's car, Ed, isn't it? It's for cruising down the highway, drawing attention. A bit like the, you know, the vet gets them wet type of thing. Well, the whole the, there is the, the wider argument. The Americans have never made a sports car. Uh, they've made muscle cars. They have even dabbled in the business of making supercars. But as in, uh, I mean, if we work on a principle of a sports car, it's not necessarily about straight line speed. It is about a lightweight, agile vehicle that goes point to point extremely quickly. That's not really in the American vernacular. No, and no, okay. it doesn't. It doesn't prevent doesn't prevent the Mustang from being a lot of fun. But no, it, it wouldn't be. It, it it wouldn't be me. You know, if I was sort of categorising modern sports cars. No, <laughs> it's it's not. It's not going to sit in that list. Um, I mean, I don't know. I'd argue that most of the time that, that seminal sports cars have been four or six cylinder vehicles rather than eights. Yeah. But, you know. Yeah. But just like uh, Aston Martins, I mean, I, I don't see an Aston Martin as a sports car. Um, no. Yeah, it's a grand tour. Well, not, not, nothing they've done since 1945 anyway. They're not sports cars. But anyway, it's interesting. It was interesting to see the sales figures that they've actually sold, I think it was 15,000 in the UK. There are a lot of them in Milton Keynes. And what's more amusing to me is that having gone to the effort of engineering it with the four-cylinder EcoBoost engine, almost every single one I see is a V8. Yeah, well, that's that, you know, that just, that's the pride of Britain there. I'm so, so proud of my fellow Brits that they went out and bought the V8 and, and didn't go with the EcoBoost. Because um, it's a bit like buying a hot dog without the sausage. So you, 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 we can all enjoy the sight of grown men weeping at filling stations the length and breadth of the United Kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> our, our, our nation's roads look the better for, for the, a couple of them biffing around. Yeah, so anyway, I thought that was interesting, that it's the best smelling... Best, best, spe- <laughs> best smelling car. <laughs> How does it smell? How does it smell? Well, it's no leather because it's all fake. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, can I can I just just put one at that uh, that the um, Morgan Plus Four has been Britain's best smelling new car for uh, the last forty five years. It smells and amazing. Nothing, nothing smells like that. It's fantastic. Right, absolutely wonderful. I think we I think we we need to uh, we need to move on swiftly. I, I mean, I'm hoping that the sun is still out while you're listening to this, dear um, listener, because at the moment it is blazing sunshine outside. Uh, we're all sitting in dark rooms recording podcasts and wishing we were somewhere else eating an ice cream. Uh, let's move on. Current competitions. What can we win, Mark? Uh, still available is the Scan EE 4G EE. Is that right? Action Cam. Uh, which um, doubled up on EE. So well, I, I, I that's not what I'm reading it from the page. Mark. It says Scan EE 4G EE. Anyway. So I've, I've, I've got win an EE 4G Action Cam courtesy of Scan. What are I'm you reading? reading? I'm reading it from the actual page on AV forums. But well, I don't point me sending you a running order. We're not going to use it. Unreliable. <laughs> oh, no, I'm using it. I was, I was just, you know, getting a bit more meat on the bones. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't mention yeah. it comes with a viewfinder watch and 32 gigabyte micro SD card, did you? I did not. No. Yeah, well, there you go. I didn't know that. Well, there you go. 
So it pays to explore. Thank you very much. Uh, and yeah, that's available to all members living in the UK, Ireland, and the Isle of Man. And that one ends on the 29th of June. Previous yeah. winners? N own. Sorry? N own. None. Trying to be clever there, Mark, and it just went, over, yeah, went over everybody's yeah. head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's because O N E is not own, it's one. N one. Oh, for God's <laughs> sake. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not getting into it, that. Uh, can I just say it is too warm for this shit? <laughs> <laughs> I agree. My ears are sweating. Let's get on. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, so, Ed, you missed last week's uh, enthralling podcast, a two hour recording session, and you weren't even there. I don't know what to say. You obviously just didn't sedate with us heavily enough. Uh, no, it, uh, it was everybody that was talking. I mean, I, just, I couldn't have control them. It was. I don't know well, what was in I, the water. I don't know what to say. I was busy biffing around the exhibition centre in Munich at the time. So, so what was the, what was the jam and sausage like? Good. Uh, do you know what? I landed at Munich Airport at nine p.m. By ten thirty p.m., I was in the centre of Munich having the sausage platter. <laughs> <laughs> because there are prior, there are certain things a man has to do upon arrival in Bavaria and the sausage platter was one of those things and it was bloody marvellous so in answer to your question sausage both at the show and in Munich is, in general was, was excellent and I, although I did go to a Vietnamese restaurant on the second night which was fascinating because I've been to a Vietnamese restaurant um, in France and I've been to, now been to a Vietnamese restaurant in Germany, and I have to say that a lot more of Germany creeps into Vietnamese cuisine <laughs> in a Germany. <laughs> in a, in lots of meat. <laughs> but um, yes, that was that was that was good. Um, the show itself, I suppose, you know, rather than me discussing, you know, what what processed fats I ate over well, the course, well, of- we haven't even touched on the alcohol, and I mean, we know what German Germany's famous for. I do you know what these days I um, I just I don't go that mad uh, it was interesting I went out there with uh, a good friend of mine who uh, took a lot of the photos that I've used for the show uh, it was his first Munich show and I obviously I went out and he I got back to the hotel about midnight retired to bed he came home about 3 uh, 15 and he was just <laughs> he was a broken shell of a man but um yeah you, you can you can obviously do munich at various different levels i mean i was trying to work it out it's my eighth or so munich show so i didn't i didn't feel the urge to go ballistic but the beer remains excellent um i personally think that Paulina is as good as it gets from munich beer but there were you know there's a a strong argument for the curiously named hacker shaw so yeah that's all good as well but did you actually want to speak about the sort of electronic bits of this or can you not be asked yeah well the, the thing that uh, I guess disappointed me in the end Ed because they weren't actually demoing it but the 50 inch subwoofer certainly drew my attention uh, there is an anecdote to the 50 inch subwoofer they did actually want to run it hourly just to do sort of run it through a sort of test tone sequence but a number of other exhibitors in the immediate vicinity basically turned around and said if you do that we won't be held responsible for our actions. So they went, yeah, all right. <laughs> so they just, so yeah, most of most, it was basically being there. So you could have, you know, do a Back to the Future style photo in front of it. Um, but yeah, who, who is me, it aimed at, Ed? I mean, other, other than stadiums. <laughs> I, I, to be honest, I don't know. I believe it's one of those things where it's more a case of showing that they can do it than expecting to sell a busload of them because the laws of physics don't you know they don't take time could you, off could you even fit one in a bus <laughs> if you took the seats out yeah um it right. was it was just the, the the thing is that laws of physics don't take don't don't take time off ultimately going from 18 to 50 inches it's going to improve the frequency response down at the sort of Nine well, I mean, the, the the thing is, the the bigger it is, the more air it moves. Um, the more air it moves, the lower it can go. Yeah, to sim- as are, simple as that. Yeah. But obviously, there there are issues with that. I mean, the, you, a better design would actually be to um, to have a, a a longer cabinet than a bigger driver. Bigger driver, yeah. you have to you have to stop it. You have to move it. And you have to move it pretty damn quickly to get it to stop and move and and all the rest. Of it. So, the the real uh, physics and science there would be the size of the magnet and how they're going to physically move that driver backwards and forwards to move the air. Whereas you, you'd get a better result if you burrowed out a, a long concrete 
uh, channel in your floor going back yeah. and forwards a few times and then put a 10 inch driver in it you'd probably get Good more straight horn you'd have yeah. something exceptional but this is the thing the other i suppose the the most succinct if cynical way i can summarize why it was done is because under normal circumstances myself and most of the other uk press wouldn't have gone anywhere near that room but instead we all beat a path to it to take a photo of a ridiculous subwoofer yeah, so st- standing in front of it with your guitar, do a... So yeah, that's that's it, it, in that regard, it succeeded absolutely perfectly in what it set out to do. Um, uh, it, I, I mean, in, it's one of those things. I, in in some ways, it was quite interesting that it was in part represented the fact that Munich has come a very long way actually, because uh, as I hope the show report showed, there's a lot of it. It was it's now used as a launch point for a lot of you know sensibly priced attainable equipment it's not simply a festival of things that cost as much as my house and av is now starting to be a significant part of of what it's done i mean a couple of years ago the idea that denon would choose to use their demonstrating space as a 20 seat cinema would have been absolutely unthinkable but they did and it was very very good although their popcorn was minging <laughs> what, what, um, what were they using in there uh the flagship amp whose name escapes me bolstered by two of their flagship stereo amplifiers obviously definitive technology uh those funny bipolar loudspeakers which i have to say in an av context were more impressive than i've generally found them in a music context so yeah that was that was good there were a couple of other decent av dems doing the rounds at the show and it one of the things i quite like about munich and i think this is a criticism I had of CES when we were out there. CES is busy showing you all manner of very high specification equipment, but it's not giving you any answers about what you do to get started in 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 the in, in as a hobby, as a pastime. Munich, in some regards, is even more high end than Vegas, but at the very least, in the same space as those million dollar systems. That's, and by, that's my, the big. That's the big thing. Same space because obviously at CES. You've got the Venetian, yeah, which is out. which yeah. is just high end, um, yeah. and and the lower stuff is at the convention center, which is you know sixteen blocks in the opposite direction. Absolutely, in one space, there was everything from getting slightly better sound out of your smartphone, through to million dollar systems, and it it felt it feels cohesive. It feels like the industry has got some answers and some structure, and it, you feel less sort of. <sighs> Disappointed is the wrong word. You feel less uncomfortable about someone showing a $20,000 tone arm when less than 100 feet away is another manufacturer showing a decent selection of turntables that you could reasonably buy as the starter point, which would act as your the beginning of your 20-whatever-year journey to possibly even considering buying a $20,000 tone arm. A gateway Ed, drug, basically. Ed, is, yeah. it, is there still the, the whole Russ Andrews snake oil approach is there is there some food that i my work that of course there's there's cable elevators there's people making <laughs> spurious very unset, un, unusual claims about uh the properties of various conductive metals but equally there's also some cracking engineering on show as well there's some uh, th- there's some really clever and, and really impressive things and there's also Munich never ever fails to sh- show at least one item where you had no idea it existed but now you've seen it you cannot possibly live without it and in this case there was a German company called Hanel H-A-N-N-L they make record cleaning machines now they're quite a fringe interest at the best of times but Hanel has gone oh look other people are making devices with smartphone app control why don't we make a record cleaning machine with smartphone control? And they have, and it works beautifully, and it's really, really, really clever. And it's one of those things that, in no way, shape, or form, does anyone need that. But having seen it in action, I covet it. I want one unconditionally. Um, and things like that just it never fails to put me in a good mood. And I, I have to say, it's still if there was one big hi-fi show non-uk one that you you know you would consider visiting it should be that one it's not significantly more expensive to get to for me than bristol and it's absolutely fantastic it would be the one i would wholeheartedly recommend you make a beeline for it is it is amazing nowadays that you know it's cheaper for us to jump on easy jet flights to munich than it is to drive down the m1 to london yes 
Well, no, that's that's quite specific a couple specific of years though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I could fly first class. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Phil could single-handedly remove the OPEC production glut by driving to Munich. Hey, it's, it's not just me. It, it seems like you've got a swarm of V8s around you down your way, so, you know. This is true. And well, also, I did um, my my wife... Uh, when you fill up the Fiesta, it's got that little tip... Uh, the, you press the button on the end of the stop to fob to reset the trip, but she had it on the wrong thing, so she reset the lifetime mile per gallon average. Oh, never. So, at the moment... Um, it's been biffing around urban and relatively enthusiastically, and it's doing like 28 miles to the gallon. <laughs> Ed, Ed, I get 20s round the doors. Welcome to the future. Okay, Amazon have added live channels to Prime Video. What's this all about, Mark? Uh, they certainly have. Uh, it's called, imaginatively, Amazon Channel. You were not expecting that, were you, Mark? No, it's not. that's not per the running order. <laughs> Let me just say. Um, yeah. Quite right. But um, yeah, as they did in the US, they've um, added a selection of live TV and on demand apps that are all accessed via. Um... Is this terrestrial TV, Mark? Partly. P- partly not. It's a mixture of stuff. Um, it's at the ITV hub, uh, you can, the Discovery Player, the Eurosport Player, Mubi, BFI Player, MGM. Uh, here and, and a load of others that are, frankly, you know, of limited interest, I would think. Um, they attract a subscription. Um, ranging from two ninety nine up to about six ninety nine a month, depending on what they are. Uh, you can only have them if you're an Amazon Prime uh, member, so uh, that's a uh, seven ninety nine a month. So is that on top of your Prime Video? Yeah, all on top of your Prime Video. But the the thing the thing is the interesting thing is it, it's it's like a pick and mix kind of um, approach to TV. So you're only paying for the things you actually want to watch, which is where I would like to go. Now, clearly, it's in its infancy and. And these kind of deals are difficult to to strike with channels, but um, it, it, the idea of having everything in in one interface is where I would like to go, and just be paying for the things I would want to watch. Now, as it is, I think it's a very expensive solution. If you if this this was your prime, excuse the pun, delivery of um, of TV, uh, it would soon add up. Um, but I, I think we've got to get away from from this broadcast sort of model we've got at the moment, and you know, uh, it's, I think it's finding it more interesting than actually useful at the minute. This this idea, but um, yeah, this is this is where I would like to see TV go, but with more, but with more choice and cheaper, lower prices and cheaper fees. And cheaper fees, yeah. Yeah, see, I, I'd have been interested in it, maybe at one ninety nine or two ninety nine, but another seven quid on top of the Amazon. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's it. That's it, and that's only for one thing, isn't it? You, you disco- Discovery is four ninety nine, which is probably something you'd be interested in. And, and, Ed quite likes Eurosport, don't you? Which is um, six ninety nine a month. But then you've got, oh, of course, you've got to add in your eight pound a month for Prime, and it, you're already paying fourteen. You've only, you've only got one thing extra. So as it is, I mean, you, it's probably more economical to to, to have um, you know the contract you need through Sky or, or Virgin or BT. Uh, is it? Uh, do you have to take it for the twelve months, or is it? Uh, no, it's we, no, it's month by month. Which okay, is, so I mean, you, you could just binge on a month and see yeah, everything so you, you want to see. For instance, if you're watching a, a Tour de France or something like that um, for a month, you, you might want to subscribe to the Eurosport player for seven quid. You probably get value out of it that way. Um, yeah, well, it, I think actually, if obviously we've got Le Mans uh, next month, well, uh, in June, uh, seven quid is that's pretty price comparative with Eurosport's own player. Is anybody still racing Le Mans? What do you mean? Well, I, yeah. there's there's fifty something cars, so I assume they have drivers. Yeah, but I mean, it, the companies were they were they not pulling out left right? I mean, Audi left and Porsche well, still there. Or? Porsche is still there. Toyota's still there. Uh, Nissan's got something weird. To be honest, the 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 flagship class is never the most interesting one to watch. The prototypes and then GT. Uh, GT2 and sorry GT3 and so on and so forth with the sort of cars that of of a recognisable shape. That's always much more entertaining to actually to what to watch and there's lots and lots of those. But no, the headline specific because like so many of these things, the um, legislation is all about saving the planet and being a hybrid and being and the 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 costs of doing it are so ferociously high that most people can't be asked. It's self defeating. But I digress. That's not anything to do with Amazon's channels. But uh, it's more more the point that for seven quid for one month, actually, that's not for that specific event. That's not bad value. Thanks very much, Mr. Ed Selly, Amy Forms motoring correspondent. <laughs> Moving on, uh, Mr. Botwright's game of the month. Now, Mr. Botwright's not here, no. so Steve, you're going to jump into this because you've actually gone and bought a game. So you're going to have, yeah, game, game of, of the month. month. 
um, by default because it's the only game I bought this month. But uh, yeah, I bought Farpoint, which uh, has just been released for the PSVR, and it, I bought the version that comes with the AIM controller, which is looks a bit ridiculous in real life, but uh, in the, the, the virtual world, it looks like a machine gun. Um, it's basically a, uh, it's shaped like a um, sort of a rectangular curved device for holding that, that's got a ball at the end but uh, you hold it like a machine gun and then in the are you sort of inferring it looks a bit like some sort of stimulatory aid no 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 it looks more like um like half of a zimmer frame or something like that uh, much <laughs> quite appropriate you, then, you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a halfway to a zimmer frame yeah if you imagine a sort of a, a, a white frame that's basically in the shape of a gun oh it's weird um, yeah, you're looking at it. Yeah. Um, mm. But obviously, yeah, I mean, it looks weird. The idea is that the ball at the end is tracked by the camera, so you hold it like you're holding a machine gun, and it's got a trigger and everything. And then, but in the virtual game, obviously, you're um, you look down at your hands, and there's a machine gun, there, and your brain just accepts that. And that's seventy uh, it's great. quid. Just well, that's the game. The game's forty quid. Oh, so you get the game it comes with, with the game. Yeah, right, it comes okay. with the game. Right. Okay. Will anyway, it do it's anything else? Right. Is it only? Is it bespoke to that it's game? Designed for, for no. Well, it's, it's not specifically just for that game. It's been designed for first-person shooters. Right. Um, but this is the first game released that's, that's been designed or created specifically for for the aim, aim controller. I'm sure there'll be other games too. But it's brilliant. It's, it's basically if you've ever seen the film uh, Starship Troopers, it's, it's like being in Starship Troopers without too many bugs. Um, and oh, I love it. It's brilliant. I, I just I like a thing I said a couple weeks ago. I'm I'm crap with the actual hand controller. Um, with first person shooters but uh, give me an, an actual gun in my hand that I can just aim and pull the trigger and I'm as happy as a pig and shit so I love it so that's Steve's game of the month <laughs> what will be your game next month <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, so back to Mark Botwright next month <laughs> yeah um, yeah it's just too hot I can't even bother that <laughs> <laughs> melting aren't you <laughs> yeah I'm melting I'm melting and um, MP3's dead, Ed. It's not dead. Can we be very clear about this? The license has expired. So the company that invented it no longer gets any money. That does not make it dead. <laughs> well, it was <it's> Mark's headline. <laughs> yeah, all right. No, that's but no, that's completely fine. That's everyone's headline. That's because that's the spin that's been put on it. It simply means that it is the first uh, compression compression based format for which the like the patent license has expired so it's now essentially free use if you uh, have mp3 support on a device you no longer have to pay the Fraunhofer Institute any money for it that as I say does not constitute it being dead there, there is a wider point to this it's it's you know obviously as a uh, in technological terms mp3 mpeg3 is is a very old thing i mean we we've we've come a long way in in understanding how we compress and decompress information since then but in some regards it's impressive how effective mp3 has proved to be that we've, actually we haven't rushed into changing it we've, we've got to remember as well ed that, that when mp3 came along we were still on dial-up and, yeah, absolutely. And, and it made perfect sense back then when you're on dial-up if you wanted to share files of that size it it took a long time and MP3 was was a solution for the that period in time. Um, when you look at things now and you see the internet speeds that, except for Steve, um, <laughs> everybody else on the podcast gets, yeah, um, it's astonishing the quality you get now. I mean, I've, I've just finished the review of the Lingdorf and um, I had my MacBook Retina connected via the um, USB port. On that, and it's it's an additional four hundred ninety five pounds if you want to have the USB port on this Lingdorf amplifier. Uh, but it recognises the amplifier, and then when I went into Tidal, Tidal recognised it, and then I was able to play MQA Masters directly into it. Mm. And that that is just astonishing quality. Um, yeah. When you when you consider that that's what you're streaming, and and the, the you know the lossless compression that, that that's using, it's and then you look back to the birth of you know the internet and MP3 all those years ago, back in the the, the late nineties, and we've co- we've come a huge distance in that that length of time. Yes, um, we have. It's twenty years, isn't it? Twenty yeah. years ago. That... I, I remember buying the. Uh, it was called MP Man. I don't even remember what they said. Little black Just about, thing, yeah. the size of a cigarette packet. MP Man. It, it stored, I think, up to about ten MP3 <laughs> files. Yeah. and that was in 1999. It was state of the art back then. Like, I had like ten songs on it. Like, yeah, listen to this. Um, 
yeah, we've come a long, long way. Well, in 20 you years. know, we, we've got to hand it to MP3 possibly saving Apple and, and making Apple the company it is now because it wasn't for MP3 and MP3 players, then Steve Jobs wouldn't have the idea to rip off and, and do his iPod. Well, there's that. Um, it ultimately, as you say, it's a product of its time. It, it, it existed to bypass the limitations of internet technology such as they were. But then it also it's it's also shaped. I mean, in some regards, it's had a very negative effect. It, it's one of the things that's responsible for the death of the idea of listening to albums. You know, we now just sort of assemble random playlists and so on and so forth. And you know, I can I suppose I can get all 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 mardy about that. But equally, um, the idea that you know, getting get in the car, Bluetooth syncs up and. I, I use compression on the stuff I keep on my phone for the car because when driving around, I, I've done some tests with lossless and I've done some tests with, you know, the, the compressed storage thing. In the car, I can't tell the slightest bit of difference. So there's absolutely no point uh, in having you, the lossless phone. Unless you've got, unless you got one of those really clever stereos. I, I had one in my Audi where it has the microphones in the headliner and it, it acts like a... Um, like these noise-cancelling headphones but it takes the rumble yeah. out of things. And it actually I works. It actually it, really works. I find I, I, I find, I've heard it on those on a couple of occasions. Sometimes it's extremely impressive. Other times there are specific road surfaces and situations that seem to make it go bananas. Okay, but, more no. than correspondent. Thank you for that. But no, I, I agree. <laughs> it's but even then, uh, it's one of those things where it just doesn't require me to you know have a specialist. Play. I just have a, a load of files on the phone and away we go. So that uh, for that i'm eternally grateful and as i say it's t- it took quite a long time before um you know aac and so on and so forth came along with a more effect- effective compression set to you know to actually achieve a, a, a slightly higher level of performance and even then the differences are not significant they're slight so you know it it was trem- it's tremendously important and it's not going away if you you know if you buy something on amazon your compressed version still comes in mp3 and if you buy a load you know disappointingly perhaps if you buy a number of our albums on vinyl if you um get look, look get the download card unfortunately it still comes out as an mp3 version rather than a flak one so it's not going anywhere it's just as i say it's become it's become royalty free Another thing that amazes me, um, and and I I didn't really think about it until I was doing it, was uh, you sent me these headphones up, Ed, these AKGs, yeah. which I I hate any of your headphones, but I actually like these ones because they go around your ears. So it, the the reason I hate any ears is a the compression on the inside of the ear, but also you always feel like they're being pulled down by the cable yeah. and that they're going to pop out. Whereas these ones that you sent me, the cable goes around the ear, so it doesn't. You don't have the weight on the ear, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, but the other thing, the other day, is that I just, you know, it just dawned on me that I'm streaming Spotify and I'm six miles from my home and my my Wi-Fi hub. Just, just at that point, realizing that actually I'm doing this over four G and I'm streaming and it's using absolutely decent quality and it's using hardly any of uh, of my allowance a month. Yeah. Yet I'm out and about streaming that, and when I'm in the car, I'm doing the same thing. It's so, um, so yeah. I mean, who would have guessed twenty years ago that that's that's the state that we we would be at, where you could just wander around and be streaming high quality audio into your ears or into your car um, over mm-hmm. the air. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, game. we're getting there. Um, so it, it, as I say, it, it's extremely impressive, and I, I, in some regards, uh, there is a bit more to be had out of compression. Uh, I mean, it's different in so much as what we're looking for now is. Uh, compression decompression sort of more like what MQA is doing um, but yes being able to fold a lossless file into a, into a transmissible thing where it takes up less space and then unpacks again is that you know that's going to be obviously very important for audio but arguably even more important for video so uh, it mp3 if you like is is the is the start point it's the it's the first base and you know we, we we've got to keep pushing we've got to keep improving and you know just changing the requirements of what we need from it but it's it's proved to be an amazingly durable start okay i guess we better get on to the big elephant in the room which is the big review of of the week the big review of the end of the month and that's steve and you're reviewing 
the Panasonic EZ 102 4K OLED TV. The review's been up for a week. People have had a chance to read it. We're not going to go over it all again because people yeah. can go and read it or they can go and watch the video or they can watch the sentence video. But what's your final thoughts on the Panasonic, especially now that you have um, other OLED TVs now coming in for review? And, and where, where do you place it? Uh, I guess is is the main question. I mean, we know it's it's a semi professional monitor, so yeah. We're about I mean, that's the thing people need to remember. I think when there's there's a lot of criticism about the price, and there's no question, <laughs> at seven grand, it's expensive. Although interestingly, I, I've forgotten this until I looked at it. I think I mentioned it to you, Phil, that the CZ nine five two was eight grand when that came out. Yeah. But seven thousand pounds is a lot of money. It, it's it's a lot more. It's two thousand pounds more than the A one or the E seven. Um, which you would probably consider to be their immediate competitors. Uh, so there's no question it's expensive, but like you say, Phil, it is a semi-professional monitor. This is really aimed, it isn't necessarily aimed at your average consumer. What Panasonic are trying to aim it at are people who want a semi-professional level of performance from a monitor, but don't want to shut out 30 grand on a Sony uh, professional OLED monitor. They want something that's going to come close in terms of accuracy, but is significantly cheaper. So if you're looking at a, comp a, a, um, a choice of 30 grand, or seven grand suddenly seven grand doesn't seem so expensive but for the average consumer looking to buy a tv in their lounge clearly seven thousand pounds is a lot of money uh is it worth seven thousand pounds well the honest answer is no um it's a good tv it's a great tv it's i mean uh, if you look at the review you'll see out of the box accuracy is reference and, um, I mean, and the reason that... and the reason for this and we've got to make this very clear because there's been certain people certainly on the us forums been really um you know, not thinking about what they're saying because they're saying that these are hand-picked samples and all this. Absolute bollocks. There's no such thing no. as a hand-picked sample. I mean, these samples that we get we we get sent for review, Steve, we're always finding issues with them. I mean, the, the Panasonic's got banding above black banding. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, if, yeah. If, the, if these are hand-picked samples and they're doing a pretty poor job of hand-picking them, the reason why it's so accurate out of the box is that they're using their own proprietary 3D lookup tables professional yes. lookup tables which mean that these sets are extremely accurate and the reason they're extremely accurate is they're aimed at the semi-professional color grading suite that's where they want to sell these these monitors they want to sell them into that environment that's that's part of the development behind it like you said steve so please if you're reading forums and stuff and people are saying these are cherry picked or hand picked and all the rest of it no that's not the case they actually do measure really accurately because they're Panasonic and they have their 3D lookup tables and that's the reason that they are accurate out of the box. It was their goal from the very beginning. They said so. We're going to make the most accurate out of the box TV we can make. Now, people have often asked the question, why don't manufacturers make TVs more accurate out of the box? And there's your answer. You can do it, but it's going to cost you seven grand. <laughs> that's that's the honest answer to that question. You know, To, to get, deliver this kind of out-of-the-box accuracy, you've got to basically fine-tune every panel in the factory before they leave. Which is, I guess, what they're doing. I mean, like I say, they're using well, the look-up tables. Exactly, they're using it's, it's, Hollywood colorist to help. It's it's the look-up tables that 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 that, that allow them to do that, uh, and allow them to do that in a repeatable manner, a repeatable and measurable manner, um, to get them as accurate as possible. Now there will be some variances and tolerances in terms of the panels, but there won't be that much. There won't be any more than ten percent variance in in any of these panels, which. If you if you look at the measured results on our review, that's astonishing that they're, they're managing to do that out of the box. But it's because they've got the technology built in, and it's because they've spent the time. You know, they they make professional monitors themselves for the TV industry, and so and they always have. Along with Sony, they've made the, the the little reference monitors that go into edit suites and all the rest of it. So they've got this experience, um, and they've spent the time with Deluxe and with Technicolor and other other you know. Uh, houses within Hollywood to see how they do things and look at the quality and the level at what they're doing that and that's that's how they've managed to get that technology into their TVs and into their TVs at that price point which is still seven grand's a hell of a lot of money there's no way I would pay seven grand on a TV any TV but when you look at it from from the other point of view of this is what they were aiming for then it's astonishing they've managed to do that for seven grand yeah, yeah absolutely. I assume they got a bit of extra love what the factory did as well during during setup. They, they, they will do, and um, I don't know how true it is, but I have heard it said on occasions that, that they will pick certain panels from LG Display, um, again, which adds to the cost. 
Um, and I'm sure that there's a clause somewhere. I mean, I, I haven't heard this from anybody at Panasonic. This is pure conjecture on my part. Um, but I'm also pretty sure that, that these other manufacturers that are using LG displays have to set an RRP at a certain level. I have no doubt yeah, that that is written. Look at the pricing. I have no doubt that is written in the contract somewhere. Although nobody has told us that. That's just conjecture on our part. If you look at the pricing on the E7 and the A1, they're identical. Uh, the EZ952, which is coming out very soon, will be slightly cheaper than the E7 and, and the A1, but very close to that. And that will be an interesting TV because that's obviously going to be slightly more competitive in terms of pricing, but should still inherit much of the same accuracy and performance as the EZ1002. So uh be interesting to see see how that performs when it does arrive. I mean, look, the EZ1002, like you said, Phil, it's, it's aimed at the same professional market. It's, a, it's been designed from the from the get-go to deliver out-the-box performance that's incredibly accurate. You could say, and, and it's an interesting um, inter situation where the more expensive the TV is, the less important it is that it's actually accurate out-of-the-box because you're more likely to get it calibrated, whereas if it's a cheap TV, you want it to be accurate out-of-the-box because you're not going to spend 300 quid getting it calibrated. You could buy an A1, spend 300 pounds getting it calibrated and it'll be delivering a performance almost identical to the EZ1000 out of the box so it's less of an issue I think um, at the higher end of the price scale um, obviously the fact that you can detach that speaker stand that the um, sorry you can detach the sound bar that's attached to the stand on the EZ1002 you can, you can attach the sound bar you can detach the stand and you can either wall mount it using the visa brackets or you can use a, a visa stand if you like is another tip of the hat to the fact it's aimed at people who just want it as a monitor professionally or semi-professionally and don't necessarily care about the rest of it. Uh, although I have to say, I thought that the soundbar sounded significantly better than when we first got a look at it at uh, CES. And uh, I think they did a good job, their techniques, in terms of tuning that, in terms of its audio performance. So it looks good. It sounds good. Uh, it doesn't have Dolby Vision. That's going to be something that people are going to criticize it for because obviously LG and Sony do. Uh, how important that is to you, and we've talked about this a lot, a lot on, the, on, the, on the podcast. I think in the past, Dolby Vision was less of an issue, but it's becoming more of an issue because it's becoming more readily available. Um, and, and its importance, I think, will uh, be, be it'll be important for less capable it's, displays. It's and by soon, that, I mean... As soon as there's discs out there, Steve, that can be yeah. played, and as soon as there's players that can play it, then that's when it becomes a, an issue for people because then... Because the one thing that people don't want is to have a TV that can't do a certain thing that they, if, if it's available they'll want it and certainly our members you know early adopters certainly that kind if of they've thing. paid £7,000 yeah there's yeah. that just, a bit. just I mean, that minor minor point anecdotally the B7 arrived this morning and in it, on its box it's got things like Dolby Vision Dolby Atmos you know it's got all the boxes ticked and from the point of view of a consumer going into a store there's no question in my mind that's going to influence their decision so uh, whether or not Dolby Vision becomes a big thing, whether or not you really need it, whether or not it's that important, I think at a retail level, it, there's no question in my mind it will influence people's decision to buy a TV, um, and that's just the way that, that, that you know the, the retail market works. Ultimately, as far as the EZ1002 goes, any any uh, limitations or criticisms of the television really are, aren't really aimed at Panasonic at all, because ultimately they don't make the panels; they're made by LG Display. All of these TVs. All these OLED TVs are using panels made by a single supplier. So any limitations or issues with those panels are really down to the panel producer than they are the individual TV manufacturer. So what has it got that, that's not so great? Uh, well, it's not that bright. I mean, no, no OLED TV is going to be bright compared to an LCD television. We, we already know that. Uh, we, we, there are definite variations in, in peak brightness from panel to panel. We know that from talking to LG last year. Um, I think I was getting just over 700 nits out of the uh, W7 when I measured that in San Francisco. The Sony was pulling in about 680 nits, and the uh, and the EZ1002 was about what 650 nits. But that's probably just panel tolerances, uh, as much as anything. Maybe the filters can affect it slightly as well. No, LG once again said that if they took the filter off the TVs completely, they could push it to a thousand nits. Um, inaccurate but a thousand nits but they said if you don't have a filter the reflections are just intolerable in a, in a domestic environment so they have to put a filter on um, so there's that issue and also yeah, you, you do get banding as you mentioned earlier Phil there, there was some banding on this panel there's banding above black on every single OLED panel I've seen so it's, it's, I, it's, think it's, it's, I think it's a, it's a throwback of the construction of the panel I think there's absolutely nothing you can do about it no, no there's, nothing, there's nothing Panasonic or Sony could do about it they, that's the panel they've got to work with what they're given and they can do certain things so for example where Panasonic have worked a lot is in terms of delivering more detail just above black 
and I think they've succeeded in that area. Also, uh, if you worked at um, LG's, not, yes, LG's TVs last year, there was definitely some macro blocking just above Black 2. Uh, again, Panasonic have eliminated that. So they've worked very hard in areas where they know they can add value. But there are certain areas where they just can't do anything about it. It's just they're at the mercy of the uh, people that make the panels, in this case, LG display. I think we should point out as well, Steve, that when we're talking about you know, peak brightness and all the rest of it and peak nets, and um, this, is f- this, this is for HDR. And we're not saying that OLED is bad because of that. We're just saying that the OLED is only capable of doing this, but it has that black level. Um, yeah, absolutely. When you move to LED LCD, yes, it might have fifteen hundred nits, but it has a raised black level. You know, it mm-hmm. it it can't do the the contrast and dynamic range that an OLED can do. So there's differences between the technologies, and it's something that um, you know. I think if if OLED c- can get to a thousand nits and do correct tone mapping. And good quality tone mapping, then I don't see any issue with with all that doing HDR. It's not also, that it can't do it, you know. Yeah, not absolutely. And also, don't forget, like you say, it's got the deep blacks, but also because it's um working at a pixel level, it can deliver specular highlights in incredibly it's, precise exa- detail. Exactly. I mean, you're down to the pixel level, which LED LCD will never right. do. So yeah, I mean, each technology has its advantages and disadvantages. I mean, I think when it comes to SDR. Standard down range content, um, OLED knocks it out of the park in terms of picture quality. And I would happily take a little bit of banding for the kind of performance you get out of an OLED TV, particularly in SDR, but also to a certain degree in, in HDR as well. Um, it's horses for courses, but uh, like you say, Phil, each technology's got its advantages and disadvantages. Uh, and and the, by the same token, some of the disadvantages of OLED are inherent in the panel production. There's nothing that Panasonic or Sony or anybody else for that matter can do about it. But uh, Ultimately, the EZ1002 is a fantastic TV. It is an incredibly accurate TV. It delivers a beautiful picture. It has some slight disadvantages um, inherent in OLED technology, and it's overpriced, <laughs> and it doesn't have Dolby Vision. So there you it, go. It's overpriced for the consumer, let's just... Le- yeah, yes, yeah. for the consumer. For the consumer. So let's go to our motoring correspondent, Ed. Uh, come up with an, a motoring analogy to fill in what we've just been talking about, Ed. God, you caught me on the bounce there. It is... Um... It's the equivalent of when you look at the uh, things like the Bentley Bentayga. It's slightly better than a Range Rover, but it costs a hell of a lot more. And, well, I mean, the Panasonic isn't hideous, although I saw it in Munich and I wasn't taken with that soundbar. Um, I've got to it, say, Ed, anecdotally, and this is and this is my litmus test for any kind of d- design of a TV, when the Panasonic arrived, my Laura said, God, oh, that's ugly. When the E7 <laughs> got put up, when I put up the E7 yesterday, she went, oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> so uh, there you go. <laughs> I, well, I mean, in, aesthetically, I'm still still at the uh, still on uh, Team A1. I think that's the best of the lot. I mean, it's got, obviously, that with that design comes in, intrinsic limitations, but I think it's a, a bolder piece of industrial design. You, you mentioned the Bentayga. I walked past one three times. It's three times, hideous. Three times it's... in the car park, I walked past it, and it was only on the fourth time that I was walking past that I realised it was a Bentayga. <laughs> I thought, well, oh, that's a Bentley Bentayga. Jesus, that's ugly. Uh, mm-hmm. Quar- quarter of a million quid for that. Yeah. It's and a, and, it's and a... it was silver. I hate silver cars. It was silver. Yeah, but that's because you clean cars. I like silver cars because they hide the dirt brilliantly. Um, so, yeah. Presumably, you're about to ask me, when I'm not talking about cars, about my album playlist and vinyl release of the month. Yeah, go ahead, Ed. All right, fine. Okay, right. Album of the month is uh, a bit of an odd one. This because I it, it, it's snu- it's sort of sneaking out without too much um, too much uh, sort of uh, publicity. But it is a band, a British band called Puma Rosa. So Puma and then Rosa. Um, they released an EP about a year ago, um, which included a track called Priestess. Now you may not have consciously listened to Priestess, but I bet you've heard it on television. Uh, it's a cracking record. It really is very, very good indeed. They have finally released a full-length album. Uh, it's called The Witch. Um, it's available to listen to on uh, streaming sites at the moment. Physical release is the 5th of June, uh, and the physical release covers all formats. Um, I have been doing some listening to it. it. In some ways, I suppose it might be a disappointment because not everything on it sounds like Priestess, but it's an interesting album. It goes different places. The, the, the vocalist has a very very distinctive voice um she's got great range and it's it's just a little bit different i really like it um the more i listen to it the more i think yeah i'll probably end up buying that um 
it's the one that I would uh, pick out for uh, pick out for a, a release across multiple formats, and it's all there on on streaming services. So have a listen, inclusive of the price of your subscription or for free, depending on how you do it. Um, and then my vinyl release. Well, that's turning up sometime today if Amazon uh, pull their fingers out. Uh, Kraftwerk, the German electronic band of uh, many decades now, uh, they've released a box set of material. It is slightly amusingly, in terms of our um, our own personal beliefs, in this called 3D. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But uh, uh, yeah, that's that's one of those things, uh, and it's it's the catalogue. Now, there's no easy way of saying this, so I'm going to come straight out with it. It's quite expensive. Um, it's an eight <laughs> LP box set, and it's yours for about 140 or 150 quid. Christ, that's two uh, tanks of fuel. That I know. <laughs> um, all I would say is this: that's all of the Craftwork albums. Uh, on vinyl they have they had a remaster some years ago they are absolutely outstanding I was actually uh, listening to um, I can't remember which album it was the one with Tour de France Autobahn yeah Autobahn is it Autobahn no no, 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 Tour de France is Tour de France yeah Yeah, Tour de France Tour de France that's right Um, listen to that Masters uh, you forget just how good they are and just how influential they were as well and um, I, I have to be honest, if it's anything like as good as the minimum maximum live box set from 10 years ago, uh, then you, it's, it's just going to be, well, I, it, it's going to arrive later on today and I'm going to be screaming like a little girl. Um, the other thing that's, you know, you, you might be looking at it and going 150 quid, that's extortion. If you want to buy the minimum maximum box set now used, and that is the only way you can buy it, the cheapest one I found for sale is 150 15 quid for a, what was a 50 pound box set there aren't going to be an unlimited number of these it will be a one time only thing so yeah it's a lot of money but you probably aren't going to lose on it and um if you wanted to buy all of these studio albums individually they're about 25 quid each so it does represent a saving in itself and you just get the back catalogue of one of the most influential bands that there's been of the last 50 years so I don't. I don't think there's any real downs, downsides to that, other than the fact it looks like the box set is absolutely massive. So it's going to require a bit of shelf rearrangement to actually get it in. But you know, that's by the by. And then playlists. Now I know that Phil has uh, defected to Spotify of late, but that's, he might. I, oh, no, that's only because I'm walking and um, I've, I've I've found that uh, I quite like the daily mix and the weekly discovery. That's, yeah, that's what I use when I'm walking because. It's usually stuff that I like, and I'm not flicking from album to album. That's 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 why I like it. If well, it, if it may... was quality listening and sitting down in front of two speakers, it has to be tidal every time. Well, you may be interested to know that after nearly a year of not appearing, uh, Blips and Blops is back for this month, um, and it's quite a good one. So uh, that would be my playlist of the month. It's a a roundup of electronica. And um, yeah, it's got some. It's got some good tracks on it. Is that also, a- April or May, because they're usually uh, May. It's May, right? It's May. Now, the uh, interesting thing, I will put this in the comments because I cannot remember the software, uh, the name of the software. But there is a, a piece of web software where you can enter the URL of a playlist in one streaming service, and provided that the tracks are available in the other ones, it will generate it in the other operating system. Ooh. Which is really clever. <laughs> um, so I will stick that in the comments when I can remember what the bloody thing's called. So if you are taken with the idea of blips and blops, you'll need to. I, I I don't know how much of title you can gain access to without the subscription, but I mean obviously with Spotify, you can take a Spotify playlist and just port it to Tidal because Spotify is free to access and so on and so forth. And Apple Music is similar-ish. So that's it's actually a very useful little tool. So I'll I'll put that in the in. Um, so you can, so if if you go, oh, I wanted a um, a, a recommendation for Deezer or whatever, uh, you should be able to take the playlist that I've recommended in it and then turn it into something else. So I'm thinking of you. That's cool. That's really interesting. Right, let's uh, wrap up on hardware with upcoming reviews. Um, so I'm I'm off on holiday. 
in uh, June <laughs> for for two weeks. So uh, not a lot coming from me. Although I have lined up some uh, DLP 4K projectors, so hopefully they will be coming in just at the time of year where it gets extremely hot. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm waiting to be sent a valve amp. <laughs> right, <at this> sorry. <laughs> this is valve amp weather now. Yeah, well, this is the thing. I'm I, I'm thinking. Well, I'm back from a holiday, middle of June, and I've got these. DLP projectors, which are never quiet and which always pump out a hell of a lot of heat. Uh, so I'm going to be sitting sweating. I'm pro- probably just sitting in my boxers, um, in sticking to the leather leather seats <laughs> in the mm-hmm. cinema room. There's a nice image in your head, dear listener. Uh, but Steve's got shed loads to do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as I mentioned uh, earlier yesterday, the E7 arrived. And also, as I mentioned, the B7 arrived this morning, courtesy of Richard Sound. So got those two coming up. And I am literally, and I am using the word literally in its correct meaning, I am literally up to my neck in Ultra HD Blu-ray players. In fact, I have every single player available with the exception of the UB700 currently in the house. And if I did pile the boxes up on top of one another, it would come up to my neck. So yeah, You're uh, only three for eight. So. Yeah, you, you are pretty small. <laughs> so uh, we, we're looking at uh, upcoming um, reviews and also a, a sort of a mega group test of all the Ultra HD Blu-ray players. So we're talking about the one from Sony, LG, two more from Panasonic, um, the new one from Samsung, uh, all in the, oh, and also the PS, I'm um, not, sorry, the Xbox One S as well. So I'm, I'm sure if you, I'm sure if you ask Panasonic, they'd send you a 700 as well, so then it would be up to your nose. <laughs> Just for the lols. <laughs> Just for the photo. <laughs> so yeah, all that, all that's uh, in, in, in the pipeline. Is that it? I thought you had loads no. to do. Um, and also uh, um, the SJ9 Dolby Atmos soundbar from... Um, from uh, LG as well. All right, so it wasn't that much. You were lying to me, really, when you said you had to do. <laughs> yeah, so, 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 so that's one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, seven, you've done half the ten, reviews. You've done half the reviews for the reviews. Blu-ray players. So, oh. yeah. All right. I've got some things. Well, obviously, we're fast approaching the end of the month, so um... <laughs> we're we're desperate for your reviews, actually, because I'm looking at the CMS. It's pretty light at the minute. All right, well, we've got, uh, coming from me, there is a very bold and slightly different take on an all-in-one system from a company called Convert Technologies. That's a very interesting product. Um, I would urge you to have a look at that. Um, There is a pair of rather beefy floor standers from ATC, uh, which uh, I'm hoping might be of interest to a couple of people. Uh, A turntable from Roxanne, which might be the prettiest thing I review all year. Uh, and then there is a do, do stream. Have, <clears throat> do you have to turn on the red light? Uh, at, do you know what? If you stick it to 45 RPM, there is a flashing red light that then goes solid <laughs> red when it's up to speed. So it does put on a red light. Um, there is a streamer, a little streamer from a company called Auralic, which I uh, have been very surprised by, and I'll come to that in a bit. And then, hopefully, on Tuesday next week, a sample of the Q, Q Acoustics Concept 500s turn up. Ooh. Now, we've had some run-ins with the Concept 500. Now, obviously, uh, Steve owned an art and reached the end of the, at the end of the conclusions for that Panasonic OLED that it does not warrant a reference badge. It is possible, depending on what these speakers do in room, and with the equipment that is available to hand, and that's obviously more than one amplifier, we've got more than one position in room and so on and so forth, but it is possible, taking into account their price and things like that, that we could be we could be looking at a product that badges pretty well. Let's look at, let's look at that. There is, uh, once again, listen to the Munich and so on and so forth, there is the uncomfortable feeling that whilst the price has now crept up to £4,000, as opposed to the 3.6 that we originally talked about, this is still one of the best sub-£10,000 loudspeakers you can buy. So, it's going to be interesting to see what they do once we take them out of their controlled environment and stick them in a place with a three-year-old and see what happens. So, yeah, looking forward to that. And then a little bit further down the pipeline, uh, it's been a bit of a while coming, but hopefully we're going to take a nice long look at the Technics SL1210GR. At last. At last. It, it feels like that's been, that review's been coming for a long time. Well, yeah, but, you know, best things in life are worth waiting for. Are they hand making it just for you or something? I don't know what they're up to, but it's taken a bit. Of, to be honest, um, there would appear to have been that that, that that there were no two twenty volt models for quite a long period of time. The, basically, the first couple of production runs were all one hundred and one ten volt units. You know, as, right. as scummy old world as don't deserve don't deserve product. So <laughs> uh, let's see what happens. But okay. yes, busy times. Busy times. Okay, so that wraps up hardware because Mark doesn't do anything, so we won't. Be back. <laughs>
I've got yeah, what, you got, what have you got coming, Mark? I've got <laughs> first up will be a uh, Android TV box from an Australian company called X Media. Uh, well specced, lots of big promises, uh, um, semi delivers, and that that will be coming very soon. Um, then we've got a USB uh, tuner that fits into Android TV boxes, but also into a NAS to make it a network streamer with some clever software. That's pretty good. That's called the TV Butler or the DVB Link, depending on what. So, sorry, what... I, d- I didn't follow that at all. <laughs> what does it do? So it's a it's, it's a it's a tuner for for it takes the aerial connection. Okay. And and it plugs into it's got a USB connection on the end and you can plug it into the likes of the Shield TV or a Minix or whatever and there's software to back it up with a TV guide and whatnot so you can access live TV through your your TV box Uh, you can also plug it into a network storage and then with the addition of some software on that distribute that around the home to various devices and with recording features to your network Uh, and that is nice it's good and it's relatively inexpensive uh, and I've also got a hybrid Android um, TV box with dual tuner functionality, and uh, that's uh, that's in the early stages uh, of testing. But yeah, that looks looking quite promising. Let's turn its box. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> that's fine. My bad. <laughs> And I've also got another fork just turned up yesterday. A on spec. I didn't know it was coming. A and either I don't know how you say it, it's either. Egret, or it, well, it's actually spelled Egret, which is probably a bit more northern. <laughs> it's a bit Yorkshire. <laughs> Egret for 4K Android player, which is uh, more of a rival to the likes of the Zapiti with its own built in media center uh, rather than relying on Kodi. Uh, and that's supposed to play everything, much like the Zapiti and the Popcorn Hour. It's, it's that kind of market, a bit more expensive. Okay, so, so that's sort of used coming up for the next few months, then, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> I'm well stocked. This was that one, wasn't it? Right, okay. Uh, seriously, though, that is it for hardware. We'll be back in a sec with movie news. Okay, so um, starting off our movie section, film of the month. Uh, once again, Odeon managed to get the whole 1899 out of me. Didn't go and see anything. So, Steve, you're going to have to tell us what the film... Did anybody else go to the cinema, by the way? Hey, do you went at the cinema this month? I did, yeah. That was uncharacteristic, but I did go to the cinema. Um, so by default, therefore, your film of the month is Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Which would also um, be my film of the month. So, uh, that's but in, incidentally, that's also the worst film I saw this month. Uh, so, you know, you've got to balance it out. Best and worst only. Oh, no, I watched La La Land last night. Yay. So, you know, all good. Yeah, but you did... Uh, yeah, I was going to say that's disappointing, but then you didn't like Moulin Rouge, did you? So, um, Oh, no, no, yeah. no. Can I be very clear about this? La La Land is enormously better than Moulin Rouge, but then so is watching Two Girls, One Cup. I mean, uh, honest to God, <laughs> there isn't, there are, there, I, there, I, I would consider personal injury over and above watching Moulin Rouge again. It's one of the shittest films ever made. I'm going to make sure. believes that is just utterly wrong. I'm going to make sure if, if we're doing CES this year and if you're coming this year, Ed, um, I'm going to make sure that your in-flight entertainment shows only Moulin Rouge. Well, I'll just have to bring a lot of music there with me, won't I? <laughs> the Moulin Rouge soundtrack. <laughs> yes. <laughs> on, Look, I on, can't help. Li- I limited can't help limited edition, not Ed. Limited edition on vinyl. You know, there's only going to be 500 copies, and you'd go and buy it, wouldn't you? No, no. I buy things to listen to, <laughs> and I'm not listening to that. <laughs> it's look. Okay, you, uh, you get people. You know, people can like it. They don't, don't prevent them from being wrong. No, La La Land, by comparison, is a triumph. You know, uh, it was all right. I didn't feel like I'd lost two hours of my life that I'm never going to get back, like I did when I walked out of the cinema having seen Moulin Rouge. Is, is, is it strange that, uh, I mean, I'm my, I know Steve's looking forward to it because it's got the rock in it, so anything with a rock and he's got a semi. Um, but am I the only one who, having watched the trailer for Baywatch, is actually thinking... I might actually go and see that. It's, oh, no, it's, looks, it looks great. Yeah, it does look momentarily entertaining. Whether I go to the cinema or not, I mean that's a that's a big ask for me. But I'll, I I I do quite like the idea of it. It, it looks like they they're playing it at the right level of outright stupidity. Yeah. Which 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 could be really really quite bad. Um, and and actually I think it will be really quite bad. But just on the trailer alone, it's piqued my interest enough to think actually I might go and see that. 
see how it goes. If if I need to go and and you know, being Scottish and, and go and use they, your card be, for God's sake. Well, I mean, being Scottish and the and the way that the the heat's going at the minute, it might be that I need to go there just to sit somewhere where it's air conditioned. You know what I mean? <laughs> claim claim asylum. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's that's what a lot of Scottish people, especially down south, a lot of Scottish people this time of year claim asylum in cinemas that we're good air conditioning, especially, yeah. especially gingers. What? Hang on a second, you've got to be careful discussing people of a redhead disposition. Didn't that Catherine Ryan lady cop a lot of flack? The, the her and Jimmy Carr are doing some sort of TV series, which appears to be yeah, but I've got I've got the bad taste. I've got the ginger gene, so I'm allowed to do it. I mean, my beard. If I grow a beard, it comes ginger, so I'm allowed to take the Mickey. Plus, plus, I've gone from a light blue colour to just bordering on white now because this of this. This is exciting sun. stuff. Yeah. yeah, it's getting to that time of the year where I, I go from light blue to white. Or, or if I stay out too long, like Steve with his head, I then go all lobster red. Mm. Awesome. What were we talking <laughs> about? That's, that's what, 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 what were we talking about again? Oh yeah, yeah. Hey, but then, but then you could get, you know, you could uh, do what the Rock does and then just, you know, pile the the sun cream on, eh, Steve. I mean, that's the scenes you'll be looking forward to. Maybe we will. What's a baby oil? <laughs> no. I, I I think Baywatch has been they've they, like Ed said they, they've they've, um, <laughs> they've accepted the ludicrous nature of Baywatch the original series uh, and they've taken it into a, turned it into a comedy where they've got all these lifeguards running around you know doing crime busting and obviously the police are just in despair at what they're up to and the rocks um, poking fun at himself and I think listen. You know, so we like about the man. He's hardworking. He's got three films out this year. He's already had Fast and Furious Eight, second largest film. Oh, I knew, so I knew this year. was going to turn into a blinking. Hardworking. They rock. watches out, and and then much to Mark's surprise, Jumanji on Boxing yeah, Day that's opens. <laughs> why? Anyway, yeah, why am I list, here? List of why things. have you seen the original Jumanji? The effects in it are bloody awful. That's not how I remember it, though. You, you know that. Yeah, but we, that's not how I remember it. I, rem- I remember it at the time that, that those effects were groundbreaking at the time. Yeah, they're, they're shit. Trust me, <laughs> they were shit. As well. I'm sure they probably were, but I don't, I've no desire to go and see a remake with. Them. No, I, I, I knew this was going to turn into a tribute for the Rock. So let's move things on. Um, Wonder Woman. Yeah, out this and Wonder week. Woman also opens. Um, so la- last month was my last month with my uh, Sydney World Camp before I cancelled it. So is that I, I is that all you're going to say about Wonder Woman? No, no, I was going to say, all, all I saw was Guardians of the Galaxy and then I saw Alien Covenant. But I'm thinking of get, about getting a, um, an Odeon card at the end of this week, beginning of next week, so I can go and see Baywatch. <laughs> o- and Odeon, Odeon uh, representative sitting listening to this will be rubbing his hands in glee, thinking, yeah, it's another 19 quid we're going to get. No, because I was looking at what's coming out over the next few months, thinking, like, I'm actually going to go to the cinema quite a lot, so it probably pays to get the card. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm going to go and see, well, you see that's, that's, and Wonder Woman. That's what happened when I got my card, because I, it was the beginning of the summer and I blitzed it for two or three months and then just didn't bother but actually if you look at over over the space of a year I don't think I'm actually losing that much money on it I went back over my um, City World bookings um, for this year uh, up until I cancelled it and actually I was averaging two a month so I, it was paying for itself it wasn't because uh, like these days a single ticket to the movies £12.50 uh, outrageous yeah. bloody ridiculous theft um <laughs> Anyway, that aside, I probably I will go and see Wonder Woman because I'm quite looking forward to it. Uh, I've, I've, even though it's had its flaws, I've been reasonably enjoying um, the DC cinematic universe that they've started to build. Um, this is obviously set during World War One, uh, and it deals with Wonder Woman's origins um, and um, her sort of first arriving into the, the world in general outside of her own island. Uh, and uh, yeah, it looks like it'll be fun. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. And Gal Gadot can actually act. Yeah, and she's quite fit too. So, but the, like but no, say, the thing is that with with um with the greatest of respect to Linda Carter, <laughs> she, one of um, my teenage, one of my young crushes when I was a kid. Well, you when she, you was, and a large number of other other yes. young men at the time. But she was sort of selected because she was sort of tall and did was willing to do a limited number of her own stunts. I I, I have to say, Gal Gadot is. You know, may, maybe not necessarily someone who is going to going to clear up at Oscars year after year, but there's there's a bit more depth to her, so I think she's a fine choice. So yeah, yeah Steve's sock drawer in the seventies was was pretty deprived, wasn't it, Steve? Had names on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh no, Erin uh, Gray. Oh. <laughs> Did you paint little faces on as well. <laughs> I've got a story I could tell, but I won't on the podcast. Oh, know. thank you very much. God, uh, God. God. Oh. <laughs> right, can we move on? Please. Blu-ray of the month. Again, I'm going to have to abstain from uh, from this one because um, I haven't been able to 
buy anything. Yeah, I've been just so, Ed did. <laughs> so busy. Ed? I can't remember if I bought something as La well. La Land. Did you buy La La Land? No, it was through the Sky Movies thing. Oh. No, my wife... I, look, I didn't pay any money. Look, it's the difference between do I want to drag my ass down to the supermarket or, you know, it's there oh, and it just happens. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, but it's instant gratification. Well, it wouldn't be instant for you, Steve, because it needs to come down the internet line. But it, fundamentally, you just go, yeah, I'll have that, and away it goes. Um, you know, and to be honest, both p- in picture and sound terms, I don't necessarily know if La La Land needs to be done at absolute reference levels, or at least I, I don't believe that I've been. I, I lost. I, th- I think it's a cracking soundtrack. I've been listening to the soundtrack. Uh, I've, I've yet to see the film, to be honest. Uh, mm. But I think it's com- really, really well recorded. It's incredible dynamics in it. Um, really mm. good for testing, testing stuff. Um, lots, lots of transient uh, effects oh, as well. Your transient so. whiplash is still. Yeah, still I, I use whiplash. Oh, I, yeah, I use that quite a bit. But I've got to say, La La Land, really, really good, really good. I mean, I was obviously these ATCs that are in for review. I was uh, listening to Caravan on the Whiplash soundtrack at. Um, Sorry, but at fairly anti-social levels, and they were just outstanding. Uh, I mean, this is this; these things really should come with their own ASBO. But yeah, that was fantastic. Anyway, Blu-ray of the month. Well, I, I, actually, unlike you guys, I haven't actually bought very many this month. I've only bought one. So again, like the game of the month and film of the month, we're going to go by default. Um, and it is a strange one. So I bought from Shout Factory in the US. I bought uh, Streets of Fire, which is a, a favourite of mine. Uh, which actually comes with a whole new documentary about the making of the film, which is actually longer than the film itself. Uh, plus, it includes all the other extras that have been available on previous releases. So, uh, if you're a fan of Streets of Fire, which I think is, is a much um, maligned and unappreciated movie that was a bomb when it came out, but I think it really captured something at the time and is almost unique in terms of its uh, look. And it's got some great cracking Jim Steinman songs in it too. I, I don't want people to take this the wrong way. Um, it, it, you know, in thinking, oh, these guys on the podcast, they never, you know, they never go out and see the sign up. Well, that's true. They, they never buy Blu-rays and all the rest. It, it's just, a, see, I feel guilty buying Blu-rays because I have such a large to-watch list. Um, it, it, it's literally taller than me. The pile of stuff that's sitting. I mean, some of them will be about eighteen months to two year old. Uh, towards the bottom of the pile. I, that I've never gotten round to watching um, yet. So, so what you're saying is you don't buy Blu-rays and you don't watch the ones you have bought. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> because I'm finding you know the time. There's so many demands on 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 my time um, that I'm finding it difficult. Plus, it, we're now getting to the point of the year where the last place I want to be is sat in a cinema room with a projector pumping out a lot of heat, and and, and an amplifier sitting in the corner also pumping out a lot of heat into the room. Um, so I'm not likely to get through this this pile of stuff very quickly. Can I just say that I feel less qualms. The AV has always the, been the sort of secondary part for me. I buy a bloody ton of music, and I do, generally speaking, stay ahead of it. I've got one record in the to listen pile at the moment, um, and obviously with the Craftwork ones turning up later on today. But by the end of the long weekend, I'll be all up to speed and there'll be more more to consume more to listen to so uh, you've, blu-ray you've obviously, just... you've obviously got far too, well you see this is why you rush your reviews at the end of the month isn't it because you've been spending the rest of the month sitting down and listening to blinking records uh, can i just be very clear on this i review all the bloody time I, <laughs> if i'm not reviewing i'm doing child care but uh, 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 such is the nature of the fact that i am not exclusively employed by av forums i am churning material yeah, through yeah, yeah. constantly. Yeah, the awesome. limitation is that I cannot fit any more stuff in my house. So, you know, that, that's, yeah. that's the same with everybody here, I think. Uh, I, I think uh, all our rooms uh, in our house are taken up with review kit and boxes and I mean, I've got I've got one, two, three boxes sitting in this room. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I found uh, I... <laughs> I, I bought a Riga tone arm about six months ago. I forgot I bought it. I discovered it in its <laughs> box. <laughs> I found it in its box two days ago. It's like, oh shit, I bought that. It's like, oh, that's really good actually because I can put it, I can set it off against tax in my end of year accounts. And I'd forgotten that I've got that. So I, that I'm was... sure I'm not the only person that's bought a Blu ray and realised you already owned it. A couple of times I've done that in the past. Oh, my, my dad is a master, has made that a masterclass. Um, I. 
I have to be careful with records. Uh, since I was sad and I alphabetized them, it's become easier to remember what I've actually got. But yeah, you do have to pay attention from time to time. At one point, uh, my, my collection was never in alphabetical order or anything like that, but at one point, I could tell you exactly where every disc was on the shelf. I knew my collection that well. Is it, is it like in um, High Fidelity where you're doing it in autobiographical order? <laughs> no, I, I, it was just messy order, but it was a mess that w- I, I knew where it was on the on the shelf. I had a... The thing is that record spines are just that hard, a bit harder to read. And once I sailed past uh, sort of 650 point, it just mm-hmm. becomes a bit tricky. So I alphabetized it, and it's just easier for me to know where things... I can oh, I in alphabetical order, Ed. Don't worry about it. It's the only way to go. Yeah. I mean, although that's a... Do you... um. I suppose for films, it's just straight alphabetical. It's always a bit more of a challenge with music because I mean, obviously you've got you've artist got and then artist and band and so on and so forth. Well, no, so. but artist or band and then obviously chronological order within the so say it's Pink Floyd. You start with and source. Oh, of yeah, but that's not too difficult. But more start Piper, with sorry, Piper, Piper at the Gates, of, the Gates of, Dawn, of Dawn, darling. Yeah. Care, careful, so, yeah. but it's more complicated because I've got an album, but actually two albums by Mark Lanigan Band. But then I also have an album by Mark Lanigan and Duke Garwood. So that's under L, whereas Mark Lanigan Band, that's the name of the band, so those are under M. It's it's not it's not straightforward. It requires careful Jesus thought. Christ. <laughs> anyway, Mark, did you buy any Blu rays? I did. I bought Woo! Oh, excellent. Yeah, <laughs> God I bought, for that. I never ordered one, uh, but I've not watched it, so I can't, I can't really. <laughs> <think about it. laughs> Well, I'm halfway there. I got Manchester by the sea, and and I was going to watch it, and I was, I'm. Uh, Man- Manchester's nowhere, nowhere near the sea. It's, it's it's not the Manchester you live near, Mark. No, I know that. <laughs> I know what it's about. <laughs> Jesus, give me some credit. Just because it had Manchester <laughs> in the title, I quite fancied it, but then uh, I haven't got around to watching it, and, and I find it a bit depressing at the minute. So so yeah, I'll get I'll maybe get around to watching that this weekend, and I've just ordered uh, Train Spotting Two to arrive. With ah, Train Spotting Two, absolutely brilliant. Oh well, if Train Spotting Two is out, then uh, that'll be my disc of, for for next month. So there you go, yeah. picked it already. Are, are there any Blu-rays coming out this week, Steve, that we could maybe buy? That, well, are, yes, that, are, are. that are maybe I mean, worth I mean, buying. I want to buy them. <laughs> uh, we've got Underworld Blood Wars, which is the fifth fifth Underworld film. I can't believe they've made five. Um, and also Triple X: The Return of Xander Cage, which is the third Triple X movie, but the second one starring Vin Diesel as Xander Cage. And also we've got Jackie. Uh, which um, is uh, actually uh, looks quite good uh, with Natalie Portman playing, playing Jackie uh, Kennedy slash Anassis in the week after the um, assassination. So um, apparently it's a great performance from her and an interesting film. Of the first two, Underworld and Triple X are also available on Ultra HD Blu-ray as well as regular Blu-ray. Because they're crap, so you can watch them in the highest quality possible. Yes, exactly. My Ultra HD Blu-ray of the month uh, will be La La Land. So there you go, Ed. Um, which I, I loved. I thought it was a great film. Uh, I, I really like the ambition and start and the attempt to sort of capture that feeling of a 1950s musical. The fact it's uh, they use a 2.55 to 1 aspect ratio is quite cool. The um, they deliberately push the colours in a kind of technicolour way, which the uh, wider colour gamut on the blue ultra HD Blu-ray really really emphasises. So you get these incredible colours popping on it. Um, they use the HDR quite well. It's uh, it's a 2K DI, but um, I think it's a great looking disc. And as you said, Phil, Dolby Atmos soundtrack. Um, the soundtrack's fantastic and it's delivered in Dolby Atmos. Um, less of the overhead effects in this one is much more of a kind of a sense of expansion and size and scale but I think it's a great soundtrack sounds really good some excellent extras on it as well uh, and overall uh, my disc of the month and what crap can we go and buy in UHD Blu-ray oh well coming up or at least announced <laughs> announced uh, for release in the next couple of months um, these are the US dates but I should imagine the UK dates will be quite similar because they came out of the cinema here around about the same time so uh, shouldn't be an issue uh, mind, mind, Fast you, Furious... mind you say that Steve but I have noticed recently that we've seen the, the old um, three month gap come back in again for some reason uh, Ultra HD Blue releases in this country are really slow um, there's occasionally you get like you know, Triple X is coming out at the same time as the US but some of them aren't coming out until months later yeah it's just some um, which must be great news for people that import discs, but we're going back to the old staggered release dates for some reason, and I don't know why that is the case. Because uh, there's oh, no obvious reason to do it. I've got to say, you know, the one impact of Brexit is if if you're into importing discs, my God, you're paying an absolute fortune at the minute. 30 odd quid for a disc is well, just. Good old laser disc days, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, right, Fast and the Furious 8, that's coming out on the 11th of um, July. 
and Kong Skull Island comes out on the 18th of July so a couple of discs there that I'm definitely going to buy I might buy Kong I, I, I enjoyed that at the cinema it was a good bit of Hawkeye. I'm sure it looked quite nice too it was a very pretty film wasn't it they were all shot uh, right, so to wrap up on the podcast, uh, sadly, Sir Roger Moore passed away this week uh, at the age of 89, and um, it got us thinking here on the AV Forums podcast as to who our favourite Bond was, and to be honest, I think if you are a child of the 70s and, and, and early 80s, then it has to be Roger Moore, and certainly for me, I, I can remember, um, I don't know if I understood the films at the time, but certainly... Uh, as a youngster I was fascinated by the Lotus Submarine car and there's various photographs of me and various albums as, as a child with my I, I think that car went everywhere with me um, so my memories young young memories of Bond are definitely um, Roger Moore uh, and I know Steve's going to say the same yeah totally I mean, in fact The Man with the Golden Gun was my, my first cinema going experience I can remember uh and I, I loved it and uh, yeah Spy Who Loved Me was just like you know back in 77 was just awesome you know with all the gadgets and the Lotus Esprit the submarine I had all the toys and uh, you know I think for me it's the quintessential Bond film uh, in terms of it I mean you could say I know there are arguments like Goldfinger being quintessential Bond but that you know, big spectacle globe trotting huge sets uh, ridiculous master you know some criminal mastermind with some ludicrous plan for world domination it's all there uh, lots of cool gadgets uh, and obviously Roger Moore with his tongue firmly in his cheek um, and yeah, he's he's my he will always be my Bond. I mean, I can make a case for other actors being better Bonds. I'm mean, obviously Connery established the role. I think Timothy Dalton makes a good stab at trying to replicate the character from the books. Um, and modern but, generations probably like Daniel Craig because it's more hard edged and and more realistic. But uh, but for me, yeah, I mean, obviously more is my I, Bond. It's it's probably. funny that you've missed out the one. Bond I thought was absolutely atrocious and it's funny how you've completely gone over him there and haven't mentioned Is it mentioned... Moonraker? No, no You haven't mentioned the actor at all You've gone completely... I didn't mention Pierce Brosnan. Yeah, who was the worst Bond ever. It was, the... it was so un-Bond, those films the over-the-top uh, C... Gold... I think Goldeneye was Over-the-top CGI. Um, what British spy drives a BMW? Let's go to our motoring, <laughs> Let's go to our motoring correspondent for a reply on that one, Ed one that's been paid enough money that the series actually got rebooted in the first place. Uh, we, we, yeah, it might not be trad, but we do owe. The thing, um, thing was, it was a hairdresser's. It was a hairdresser's car as well. It was, it was the Z three, wasn't it? Which I, yeah. I'm great. No, no, no. It was the Z. No, it was the Z four. No, it's Z three. No, Z three in, in Golden Eye. Was it Z three? Was it? It was as and long then, ago yeah. as that. Jesus. And then Z eight in um, the world is not enough. Yeah. Incidentally, have you seen how much a BMW Z eight costs these days? Uh, no, boring correspondent Ed. No, <laughs> a quarter <laughs> of a million pounds. Yeah, well, they only I'd, make a couple of them. Well, well, see, the, put the, like this: the, at, at the end of the time when they were new. BMW dealers couldn't give the bloody things away. Some of them sold new for about 45, 48 grand. Um, and now there are ones selling. And I don't mean hanging around on classifieds. They are selling at the quarter of a million yeah, pounds. Yeah, there's a, there's a strange thing going on in the classic car market at the minute where everything is appreciating so much in value at the minute that it's going to crash eventually and and reset itself but yeah i mean there's, there's things like ur quattro's going for you know th three quarters of a million um you know these the, these are cars from the 80s I, I, i'm sure i saw a Peugeot 205 gti i think it was a 1.9 gti go for something like a hundred and twenty thousand pounds recently uh. mint um you know these these are Cars that were stolen in the eighties. I mean, you know, a mint Sierra Cosworth. Um, you're talking upwards of a hundred grand these days. It's unbelievable. Yeah. To be fair, most of them have been wrapped around lamp posts. Yeah, the, the, um, the, there is that which makes the the clean ones rare. But as I say, having a go at Brosnan because he was compelled to drive a BMW. Uh, I mean, that, that I like you. I had some some issues with Brosnan as Bond, but equally there were certain things I thought he did quite well. I thought it was actually a fairly happy balance between Roger Moore style smut and a slightly more dynamic sort of 
on screen performance. Yeah, you know, the no, problem the problem was Ed. I mean, he started off with BMWs. I think the first two films of BMWs, and then the the, the last film he did, you know, the CGI <laughs> crap fest. Uh, he was back in an Aston Martin, but it was a, an invisible car. It was just like they just pushed can things just too say, can far. I just say it was the, just the BMW Seven series in Tomorrow Never Dies. That, in terms of the complete set of toys it had on it, was one of the coolest Bond vehicles there's ever been. And you can get all sniffy about the fact it wasn't an Aston Martin, but at least the fact it wasn't an Aston Martin, it probably could have got in it and it would have started. And also, the BMW motorcycle in the helicopter sequence. Oh, Jesus Christ. That's properly cool as well. (laughs) I think, in in defence of Pierce Brosnan, he's the first to admit that, apart from GoldenEye, all the rest of his films were crap. Um, and yeah. I agree with that. And also, the fact that he drove a Z3 meant that I got a chance briefly to be a person who drove a Bond car when I had a Z3 back in the late nineties. So, uh, why does so, that uh, not surprise me in the slightest? But no one has a go at Daniel Craig for driving a Mondeo. It was a rental car anyway, was it not? It was, yes. But he, nonetheless, he he potted around in a in a Ford Mondeo. Yeah, and then he won a DB5 at a game of, um, uh, in yeah. the casino. So he, he eventually got back in the right car. Because obviously Aston Martins, they're just the lowest profile, subtlest vehicles for our Secret Service to uh, <laughs> exactly. hammer around. Well, I think we have we not already established that James Bond was not a spy anyway. He's just a government yeah. assassin, isn't it? Because yeah, he goes around announcing who he is. <laughs> yeah, but, but, any, but anyway, I think we're digressing. Getting back to the great Roger Moore. He, he was James Bond for me. I, you've just got to love this the, the 70s crapness of the Bond and the fact that it was it, it really was played for fun I mean I'd, I, obviously I'd, I would now realise that at the time when it, when these films were coming out because I was a youngster um, but having gone back and revisited and revisited and revisited because there's not a Sunday goes by that ITV are not showing a Bond film having gone back and revisited these, these movies it was played for fun it was tongue in cheek it wasn't taken very seriously the, some of the plots were outlandish and, and are you suggesting but, that Stromberg submersible aqua battle palace might not be the most the most sort of real world and grounded bond layer yeah. there's ever been but well it's but up there with could, Drax's floating space station yeah and, but, and, but and this, a hollowed this is out what I'm getting at. this is what I'm getting at though it was so out there it was so silly and all the rest of it but he carried it and he carried it off and and he was that personality um, he was the right personality for the role, and those films would have sunk without him, um, with, with the abs- absurd uh, nature of them. If it wasn't for the way he played the character, with with a wink to the camera, breaking the fourth wall, and he did break the fourth wall quite a bit, if you think about it, um, in these movies, I think that's what made it, and I think that's what makes them really entertaining. Yes, they're naff. The special effects are rubbish. Um, but but they're just entertaining fun, and you know that's all because of Roger Moore, basically. Yeah, he was in the most Bond films of any Bond. Um, the reason he ended up doing things like A View to a Kill, and, and also Octopussy, was because that he wanted to retire. He said, "Look, I'm too old to be playing this part now. I'm in my fifties." But uh, but you know he was so popular, and back in '83 when Octopussy came out, they didn't want to go head to head with Sean Connery's Never Say Never Again with an un, with a, a new Bond, uh, and they felt the same way in 85 with a view to a kill that it just felt you know he was reliable and they could you know he would deliver the goods and he did and he's he was a i'm not going to say he was a great actor but if you see the man who haunted himself he, he could deliver a good performance he's in some other great films too I, I love the wild geese um and he's in that and he was a charming witty lovely person i think I had the privilege of meeting him he was a raconteur and, and very funny very self-deprecating loads of fantastic stories uh, and was just a class act not to be taken seriously tongue firmly in cheek and that is it for the podcast this week because we are monumentally over time uh, almost coming up to two hours it won't be two hours when you listen back to it and (laughs) and thank you lucky stars for the fact that this gets edited down so you don't have to listen to the dross that we do Uh, my thanks to Steve Withers how about a nightcap on the company my company Mark Hodgkinson Egyptian builders are you still here, Mark? Yeah. Bond, not a great subject <laughs> I, for me. I don't I like had Bond. forgotten you were on the podcast. <laughs> and Ed Sally. For me, this is all the world. There is beauty, there is ugliness, and there is death. Don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook, bookmarkavforums.com for latest reviews, news, and videos. And of course, leave us those five star ratings on iTunes, but only if you enjoyed the show. So, we'll be taking a break for our summer holidays, uh, which means there's no podcast for the next two weeks. Uh, but we're back again 
on the 19th of June so we do hope that you come back and join us then for the podcast I'm Phil Hinton thank you very much for listening and we'll see you again in two weeks time (laughs) 